Sea otters are huge as far as impacting coastal systems because they feed on a lot of the things that then have other impacts in the system. And they are sort of the perfect study species. They dive down to the bottom and they bring up whatever it is they're going to eat and they wave it around for you at the surface as sort of a, hey, did you get a good look? Sea otters are what they call a keystone species, so they have a fairly large effect on their prey communities. And they're important otherwise because they eat a lot of the things that people like to eat. Sea urchins as an example, or sea cucumbers, fish, crabs, clams, octopus, all the things that a lot of people like to eat. And when we started looking at some of our data, particularly for Kachemak Bay, I noticed that over 50% of the feeding occurring there was outside of our range of observation. And that 50% comes from tagging studies we had done so we knew what proportion of the population was hanging out where. The problem is your spotting scopes only go out so far. 500 meters, you can tell really clearly what they're eating. Past 500 meters to about a kilometer offshore, it starts getting a little more difficult to tell what they're feeding on and, and how big and how many. And past a kilometer, you can't tell what they're feeding on. And a lot of our otters around here are feeding further offshore, and we have no way to tell what they're eating out there. You can't watch them from a boat because the boat's bouncing, the otter's bouncing. By the time you find them again in the spotting scope, they're just dove again and you missed what they ate. We wanted to try a hovering capable vehicle to fly over sea otters and just basically watch them feed and get that same foraging information from offshore locations. Because we assumed, in fact, that it could be quite different than what's happening near shore. And the first question was, well, does anybody know how otters will even react to UAS flying overhead? And so that was our pilot study we did, our first assessment at, can we successfully use these undetected to observe sea otters. Can we fly over them? How low can we get over them? Will they tolerate this rotary wing aircraft kind of buzzing overhead? We weren't able to fly these units ourselves as government scientists. We had to work with the quasi-pilot and sort of direct them where to go. And we thought going into this, oh, we'll just fly right out to where they are and you know, you fly out to where you expected them to be, and you're looking at the screen, and you're going, wait, I don't see them. And One person would spot the otter that we wanted to target, and then there were two people that sort of triangulated the person that was driving the UAV over to the otter so we could tell them, oh, you went too far, or you're, you're not looking at the right otter. And it was actually a lot more difficult than we thought because the UAV camera only has a certain amount of range and we wanted to go in pretty high up so that we wouldn't disturb it. So we flew out, I think, at initially about 40 meters in height. And then as we approached, we would look for reactions. And if there were none, we would then hover over the animals and then slowly start bringing it down. And what we learned, though, is that if you come in high and then the otter dives down to feed, and then while the otter's down, you lower it a little bit and then he comes up and he eats whatever he is and then he dives again and then you can lower it a little bit more. And you can keep doing that and get actually pretty close to the otter that way. And when an otter responds to a stimulus, it can be something as simple as looking at it or it can be the animal just what we call blowing out and they'll make an escape maneuver where they dive and swim away and then they'll usually not go too far and they'll kind of periscope up and take a look back to see what was going on there. We're coming in and every once in a while we'd get one to kind of look at it, but that was about it. Maybe one of them slowly swam away. Nobody completely freaked out and dove or just took off from the area. And some of them didn't even look at the UAV. We dropped it to 10 in most cases and often didn't really have any reaction. And we did drop it as low as five meters, and I actually wanted to drop it to the point where we disturbed them a little bit. I wanted to know where our kind of threshold was. Basically, at five meters, everybody noticed it. <laughs> That's not all that high. They hear really well, and I think that if you try to come in too 
quickly, then they would hear it and be like, oh, what's that? And, and then they would go away. But if you just come in slowly, it's like they don't notice the difference in noise as it's coming closer and they just acclimate to it. Single animals tended to be less concerned. We did see that probably the most sensitive animals seem to be, not surprisingly, females with pups. And also, not surprisingly, when the conditions were absolutely just flat calm. If there was no breeze, it was completely still, you could actually hear the UAS flying and you could almost feel the draft coming from it. And so we started to realize that, well, we don't want a lot of wind, we do want a little bit just for cover. And when you start thinking about behavior, it's a whole other component, not just of, I've got to get my unit over there, but I need it to be stealthy. And how can it be stealthy? You know, what needs to happen? So I think in terms of developing this technology, it's going to be a few years of figuring out what's the optimal unit to use, how can we make it the least detectable possible, and get the highest quality imagery. In foraging observations, all the work is you do it in real time. You look at a scope and you record the best you can, and sometimes they're doing things very quickly. And we're trying to estimate the number of items they have, what the item is, you know, what species it is, whether it's a clam or an urchin or a crab, and also the size. And we're doing all that very quickly, you know, looking through a scope and then recording it and everything all in real time. And now we would be able to do that on a video screen and you could even use image analysis techniques to like more precisely estimate size of items. It would be a big advantage to have all of the data essentially be recorded and you could go back and check it again, you could play it in slow motion, you could do frame by frame analysis of things. So it, it could be a very useful and big advantage over real time. The sea otter is a federally protected marine mammal species under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, which really should not be harassed in any way, whether by UAS or kayakers or simply people seeing them hauled out on a beach somewhere. It is in fact against the law and it carries a very hefty multi-thousand dollar fine if you are prosecuted by Fish and Wildlife Service. And that goes not just for sea otters, but for any marine mammal. Um, that's out there. So stellar sea lions, harbor seals, whales of any kind, basically any marine mammal is protected under this act and it's very important for users of UAS or any other craft to be aware of these laws when you're going out to the environment where these wild animals inhabit.